Hello and welcome to Money Matters. My name is Dave Emery. I'm with the Marshall Financial Group. We have a really good show today. I'm here with Charlie Mann of Trinity Wealth Management. Hi, Charlie. Dave, how are you? Good to see good you. Good to see you. Well, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Well, tell me a little bit about, about you and what you guys do. Okay. So Trinity Wealth Management is a uh, fee-only advisor, uh, advisory firm, and uh, essentially what that means is that we get paid for our advice as opposed mm -hmm. to getting paid to sell a financial product. Um, we work primarily with individuals and families, uh, people that are approaching retirement age and have saved some money mm -hmm. and need to make sure that that money is going to last for the duration for them and enable them to do the things that they love to do, and we help them figure that out. Fantastic. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty similar. We, uh, we're, we're a little different firm. We are a fee-only financial planning firm, which means uh, that we, uh, we don't take uh, any third-party compensation. We just, very similar to yours. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. There's so many different business models. I think the public gets confused on, on how financial professionals get paid. Absolutely. I think it's very confusing. Yeah. And, uh, it's a little uh, murky just in terms of uh, the different types of advisors, how they're compensated, um, how they're regulated, mm -hmm. um, and how to evaluate someone, you know, for those people that might be looking for a financial advisor. Right. Yeah, so we're, we're a fee-only firm, which means that we, we have two revenue streams, how we get paid. One is by, by, doing, by being retained for, for planning, whether it be retirement income planning or you know, I do divorce planning and college planning so it's a it's a fee for for consultative service that's one avenue we get paid and then the other is we we manage money so based on the the, the account value um, we have a fee schedule how, how we bill on that and I think the big difference that I've seen on fee only is that we uh, we don't we don't sell any products and we don't take any commissions for anything like that. We don't get compensated by any mutual fund companies, so our our fee structure is very transparent in that those two vehicles are how we get paid and there's nothing else. So the client really has a very clear understanding of of how you know how we get compensated. Right. So yeah. Our, our business is very similar. Uh, the one difference is that I do maintain an insurance license. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't use it very often. Uh, it's been years since I've uh, been compensated right. in that way, but I do keep it active and primarily use that to help people evaluate insurance products that they already have right. and um, help them think through whether they're good to keep or do they need to change them, that sort of thing. Right. So, yes, yeah, so we, we, we're similar uh, in that... Um, we don't. We didn't. We don't have. We haven't maintained our insurance license, but it seems like we do a lot of insurance planning and make recommendations to clients, and you know, help them find where they can go buy an insurance product, and uh, that that entity ends up making money. We right. Don't, so, and that's great for the clients because they know that you're giving them unbiased advice that's exactly. not based on earning some commission, and uh, you're really helping them evaluate those insurance products and. Uh, there's many times that you need an insurance mm -hmm. product to do something, and there's other times that people buy them because that's what the, the broker that they're talking to is selling. Right. And they're sort of, uh, you know, making uh, everybody fit into that square peg that they, square hole that they have. So, um, so that's a good, good yeah. way, a very good way of doing yeah. it. So what are some of your clients, uh, you know, so what, what are some of your clients, what's on the minds of some of their, your clients? What, what's hot? I would say, well, two, you know, the, the two most, uh, I think, important things on people's minds as they're approaching retirement is, uh, number one, do I have enough uh, money set aside for retirement? And number two, uh, will that money last for the rest of my right. lifetime? Yeah. And before you retire, so leading up to retirement, you have sort of a definite time horizon. I'm going to retire at 62 mm -hmm. or 65, so you can plan for that pretty easily. Uh, once you transition to retirement, then the time horizon is, is a little unknown. We don't right. know how long we're going to live. Yeah, I always say if you can tell me exactly when you, can pa when you pass, we can do a great job planning. Exactly. We can figure out the perfect That's way to pick right. Social Security and how do you take that pension and yep. all those other things. And, um, uh, you know, many people kind of want to live their life spending their last dollar on the way out mm -hmm. the door. And, uh, again, if we knew uh, what that time horizon was, we could help them do that really well. Uh, so we have to plan for longevity. And so those are mm -hmm. the two primary things, I think, on people's minds. When can I retire or can I retire when I want to? Right. And how long is my money going to last? Or 
people that have higher level of assets and maybe not worried about running out of mm -hmm. money, but can I sustain <coughs> the lifestyle that I'm right. used to uh, for the duration? And I think those are, are two key things on, on people's minds as they approach retirement. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, and another thing that, that we find is that uh, um, oftentimes clients don't understand even where they stand, where all their pieces are. Right. And we start out the conversation with, with um, you know, um, retirement income planning is kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle. And one of the first questions we ask is when you do a jigsaw puzzle, what's the first step you, you do? Put all the pieces out on the table. Yep. That, that's, I hear that, answer, that, that a lot, you know. Um, a lot of times I also hear is people put, put together the, the, the sides first. Oh, right, yeah, that's a good idea. But really the first step when it is you want to look at the picture on the box. Right. So the picture on the box signifies what your retirement looks like. Right. So framing it out, that's understanding the, the overall, you know, what all the different components are. And then right. helping them put the pieces in, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's basically the, the whole retire, you know, the, the whole retirement income planning. And just like you said, the, the thing is becoming even larger is how do I maintain the lifestyle beginning in retirement through the end of retirement? Right. And um, so. Um, yeah, I think as people are working, you know, they're focused on accumulating assets. And so they are busy working, saving money, kind of throwing it in different places. And uh, oftentimes there's no real strategy in place. Exactly. They're just in accumulation mode and the clock's ticking and all of a sudden they wake up one day and they go, wow, I'm 55 and you know, I better make sure that I have everything together so that I can retire when I want to. And that's coming up closer than I realize. Right. And uh, is the money invested properly? Do I have enough? How am I gonna transition this accumulated uh, bucket of money into income right. when the paycheck goes away? Mm -hmm. And some people have pensions and some people don't. And so there's different demands that need to be placed on those assets. Uh, and so helping them look at it in a, in a holistic way uh, and seeing how it might work over time is, is really helpful right. for people. Yeah, I mean, a a absolutely. A lot of times people do a really good job with, with saving for retirement or they have people, you know, an advisor that helps them save. But then when it comes to that transition point on, on the, the spending or the, the drawing down, they oftentimes are, are fearful or they don't know how to do it. And they don't right. know all the different pieces they don't know some of the stumbling blocks moving forward, you know, basically, you know, what impact inflation has over the long term, what impact taxes have, right. which I take Social Security, should, you know, if I have a pension, what are my choices around that? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's coming at a point in time when if they make a decision to leave the workforce and they feel they want to get back into it, a lot of times it's, it's difficult to come back at the, right. at the same income level they had before. Right. So. So it's imperative to do it that is. planning on I mean, the front end. And the, uh, yeah, I've seen that people that do a little bit of planning come out much further ahead than if they, uh, if they just kind of you know, um, let it happen. Right. Well, some things you mentioned, I think, that are very important for uh, people to uh, evaluate or to consider mm -hmm. in their plan. Um, and we, I, I teach uh, a class on retirement planning at oh, really? a couple of different okay. uh, schools at one, at Penn State in Great Valley, hmm. uh, and also up in Pottstown at a satellite campus Fantastic. for Montgomery County okay. Community College. So it's an adult education class, mm -hmm. and we meet with a lot of people after the class. They want to come in and sort of pick our brains, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so you can do the planning yourself. And right. uh, there's some people that are really good at doing that. But what we see sometimes is that they don't consider things like inflation right. so they have the expenses going out the door but they're not inflating that over right. time um, and uh, uh, they don't consider things like variability of return sequences right. so they'll say well, what if I make six percent a year well then everything looks good mm -hmm. but the sequence of how that six percent might work out over exactly. time the results can be very different um, and oftentimes they're doing it very simply and the numbers work but when you add those different variables, what about taxes? So every dollar you take out of your 401k plan or your IRA is gonna mm -hmm. get taxed and you gotta factor that in. Um, and all those things can vary the outcome. So I think it's helpful for people to really look at it in, in a holistic way before they have to start making all these decisions so that they can make good educated decisions. Right. And even anticipating some of the, the risk factors. You mentioned longevity risk, but you know, there's other risks such as uh, 
um, you know, aging risk so from the standpoint of, you know, where do you want to age? You know, what's, what does that look like? Um, who's going to help, help take care of you if you need that? Is there a need for long-term care insurance? You know, some of that being put on an insurance company in the form of long-term care insurance or not. Um, I mean, that's one of the big areas that, that uh, people don't realize that toward the end of life, how expensive it can be, both from a care perspective and also from a medical perspective. Right. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, the other thing that we see, just sort of in, in your question, what's on people's minds, is that um, uh, a lot of people are really good at saving. Mm -hmm. And they save by sacrificing their own desires today right. so that they can save for the future. And a lot of times they have a bit of a, of a fear uh, mentality towards money. So mm -hmm. they're afraid of running out of money, which makes them, by nature, good savers. Exactly. And then they retire, and they don't just start spending a lot of money because they can, and it just perpetuates this larger and larger right. amount of money. And, and so a big thing that we try to help them do, as I'm sure you do, mm -hmm. is to think through what are the goals for this money? Exactly. What does this money need to do for you? Right. And oftentimes they're not asking those questions, but those are the important things to help them look at it uh, in terms of, of being able to add a sense mm -hmm. of, of peace to their lives yeah. and, and joy. That's great. Well, uh, would you care to take a question from the audience? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Tim Martin from Philadelphia asks, what's so good about index funds? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say that index funds, uh, which are passive investments, mm -hmm. so they are not actively managed. They're designed to replicate an index like the S&P 500 index or uh, another market index. And uh, Vanguard built a huge company. Absolutely. Uh, was the first uh, person, John Bogle was the first mm -hmm. person really to come up with an index mutual fund mm -hmm. that replicated the S&P 500 right. index. Uh, the advantage of an index fund is that they are very low cost. Um, so they have low internal expense mm -hmm. ratios, which is good. Sure. Uh, another advantage is that you're going to get most, if not 100% mm -hmm. of the upside of that index. Mm -hmm. So if the S&P index is up 20% in a year okay. and you're in an index fund that replicates that, you're going to get about 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, the downside, and there's always good and bad with right. everything, you have to weigh those things. So the downside is if the index is down 20%, mm -hmm. you're going to lose 20%. Down, yeah. So you get 100% of the up and 100% of the down. Yeah. Um, and I guess if you do that over long periods of time, it works out pretty well. Yeah. Um, the problem is, in short periods of time, it maybe doesn't work right. out so well. Um, so you have to evaluate whether an index fund is right for you, and do you want to be passively invested and just get what the market does, right. or do you want to have an active management component that is uh, managing risk in some way right. for you? Makes sense. Fantastic. Well, great. So here's where to send your, your questions to Money Matter. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our host and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, T-V dot com. Okay, well, welcome back. So, um, kind of going along the lines of uh, uh, re retirement income planning and, and, and the comment about people that have accumulated for their entire lives uh, and have a tough time, you know, um, understanding uh, that, uh, you know, the avenues to maybe spend some of that money and what, what the money's for. Are there other clients that you see that don't fall into that category? Right. Yeah, I think there's two ways that people are sort of wired as far as money goes. One is they're fear motivated, so they're good savers, and the mm -hmm. other is they're more pleasure motivated, so they like to spend money and that, mm -hmm. you know, brings them pleasure to do that. And, uh, uh, and that can be a challenge sure. in retirement. Once the income goes away, you may not be able to spend mm -hmm. uh, as much as you can uh, otherwise. And uh, we often see that in high income earners. So mm -hmm. people that are used to <clears throat> making a lot of money, right. they have big lifestyles that go along with that. 
uh, makes it challenging in retirement to right. dial that lifestyle down. And we actually have a client who fits into that category. Hmm. And, uh, you know, we have to continually advise him that right. if he keeps going at his current rate, he's most likely going to run out of yeah. money uh, too soon. And um, it's really difficult for right. him to dial that back, to dial the spending back, because that's what he's been used to doing. Yeah, it's kind of a matter, you know, conversation. We have have had similar conversations with clients, and it's, it's a matter of choices, right? And uh, you know, or trade-offs. We like these word trade-offs. I mean, um, can you can maintain that lifestyle, but what are you willing to trade off right. somewhere up the road, right? And talk through those trade-offs, what those trade-offs might be. So uh, it, it's uh, it, it can be, um, you know, it, it can be challenging, right? And. Uh, so and I think the old the old rule of thumb was well if you stay around a four for four or five percent distribution rate out of your investment mm -hmm. assets then uh, you should be okay and um, <clears throat> I think that works well in certain market cycles and maybe mm -hmm. not as well in other market cycles. I completely agree. Uh, I really think you have to look at uh, the very vari variable return sequences mm -hmm. and something that we use as you probably do too is called Monte Carlo simulation. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it it runs as many as a thousand different variations of different return mm -hmm. sequences. So instead of looking at just an average return over time, if you make 6% a year, you're going to be fine. Right. right. Uh, you really have to look at what are the different variabilities of that average of 6%. And sometimes it's a home run, and other times right. it may not be, depending on do you have negative returns in the beginning of the retirement and the better returns at the end, or the reverse of that mm -hmm. gives you two very different outcomes. Yeah, um, the whole uh, uh, variability can, can wreak havoc um, down the road if, uh, if you don't take that into consideration. Right, and the great thing about it is we have zero control over that. Yeah. So the clients, you know, we can't control that, the client can't control that, we don't really know what the future holds. Uh, so the best we can do is look at uh, different sequences and say, okay, best case, you're fine, medium case, you're good, worst case, yeah you know, is not great, yeah. but you're not running out of money, um, or yeah. you're only running out of money 5% of the time, right. so you've got a very good probability of success. Mm -hmm. And then look at that, uh, you know, every so often and help people stay on track. Yeah, I know you mentioned it used to be 4 to 5% um, rule of thumb on, on the withdrawal rate. I, I've heard in this low, low growth environment and low um, inflation environment and interest rate environment that actually if they've dial it down to like 2.8 percent. Wow. And uh, so that's, you know, I think it's also one of these things that ha having a conversation talking through the different, you know, the different schools of thought make, makes a lot of sense. And it also comes down to trade-offs, just kind of like what right. you said. So. Well, if you think about it, for the last 40 years, we've had declining interest rates. Right. So it's been a 40-year bull market for bonds. So in addition to getting your bond yield mm -hmm. on your conservative investments, you're also getting growth or appreciated mm -hmm. value on those bonds. Well, bonds uh, have an inverse relationship to interest rates. So right. we're most likely going to be in a rising interest rate environment, which means that safer, more conservative part of the investment allocation mm -hmm. is most likely going to struggle through that. Right. And, um, and that can be a, a good component of that 4 to 5 percent return. Right. Uh, sequence and if you look just since the election uh, the S&P 500 is up I don't know 10 to 12 mm -hmm. percent the bond markets up probably less than 1 percent right. so that's really hurt conservative investors these zero percent Absolutely. interest rates since 2008 has have, have hurt uh, the conservative fixed income right. investors yeah so over the, over the next 30 years there's going to be something like 30 trillion dollars worth of wealth transfer from one generation to the next what, what do you see or anticipate is uh, some of the problems with, with regards to that? Problems or opportunities, maybe? Well, I think, you know, there's maybe two problems. And one is that um, uh, for advisors, mm -hmm. you know, they want to make sure that they're getting to know the younger generation of their older clients so that they can help out in mm -hmm. that transition and be a trusted advisor right. for that second generation. Uh, so that they don't take the money and, and spend it all and, and you know, uh, not utilize right. it to, to their ability, their best ability. Um, and I think uh, just for, for a younger generation, maybe uh, how to deal with that money and, right. and to manage it and to be a good steward over it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what I yeah. would think. Yeah, I, I, I completely, completely agree. Um, 
Yeah, there's been studies done, and this has been over over time, you know, many, many hundreds of years. It doesn't matter what culture you're in, in the United States or across the, the globe. And what uh, what they found is within three generations, over 90 percent of the wealth transfer is is gone. Wow. And so. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, as I've kind of looked into this a little bit more and studied it, I've found that the reason why that wealth gets, uh, you know, the, the stewardship doesn't follow has to do with two reasons. One is communication between the generations and the other is trust. So, and I've seen that with some of the clients uh, that I've had that I've seen wealth transfer from, from the person that made it to the second generation and how exactly what you said, you know, one example about the client that, uh, um, you know, basically, you know, was spending the, the wealth. I mean, I, I see that the one big thing that is, is, has been common through that has also been communication and trust between siblings. Right. Um, so the one of the big areas that, um, that I've found is that if you can kind of flip that to be what, you know, what do the 10% temper, instead of the 90%, how do they get it? And the one big thing is correcting that problem. Right. So. And I think it goes to that uh, um, that comment about you know f financial. Oftentimes, when when um, a client passes, the 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 financial advisor gets changed, right? And it's because of the relationship, right? And I think if there's an avenues to help the families with regards to transferring that emotional inheritance and the the value system, that's what's going to help with regards to. Uh, both the advisor and the family from transferring the what's really of importance is the value around that money. Right, and for those people that have the wealth that are going to transfer that either mm -hmm. during their life or on their death, to involve mm -hmm. their right. children in in um, you know that that wealth transfer mm -hmm. process as opposed to uh, you know maybe not wanting to tell the kids about mm -hmm. how much money they have, right. um, but really sort of passing on that stewardship role to them. Uh, so that they view it as something that they need to be a good steward right. over as opposed to, you know, hey, great, I got $2 million so I can go out and buy a new Porsche, right. you know, but to, to really try to be a good steward over that right. money and maybe pass it on to the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So where do you see our, our industry going, financial, financial service industry or the financial planning industry? Well, you know, it's funny because uh, <coughs> I go to a lot of um, uh, events and uh, custodian mm -hmm. uh, trade shows and that sort of thing and, and the industry seems to be concerned that the robo advisor mm -hmm. so the technology platform is going to replace what you and I do right um, and uh, the industry seems to be pretty concerned about that mm -hmm. um, and I just don't see that happening I think there's always going to be people that are going to want someone to sit down with that can help them particularly through right. challenging times bear market cycles, the death of a loved one, mm -hmm. um, and how to navigate those things and make good decisions along the way. Uh, and I, it's a similar to uh, the, the CPA sort of tax mm -hmm. uh, advice industry to think that TurboTax is going to put CB exactly. CPA firms out of business, and clearly that hasn't happened. That's right. So while there may be this need for mm -hmm. the millennials to have a, a, a kind of a robo-automated solution that they can do on, online and from their phone, I just don't think it's going to replace uh, what we do. Right. And so I think as this wealth mm -hmm. transfers, there's going to be even greater need for good advice and, and help and people that are really acting in, in your best, best interest, interest right. which yeah. is what we do as fee advisors. That's right. You know, we have that fiduciary responsibility to our clients yeah. to always do what's in their best interest. Right. Yeah, I mean, kind of like, you know, TurboTax, you know, there, there is a space for that. People do use TurboTax. Right. People will use robo-advisors, but I think you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's becoming more of a thinking partner with your, with your clients and, and helping them make the best choices, you know, for them based on, you know, the, the, there's such a, a humongous amount of information out there. It's almost like information overload. Right. You, know, you can do financial, you know, anybody can do financial planning right. if they want to devote the time and the effort to it. But, you know, I think uh, a lot of the financial services is going to go toward um, having a trusted fiduciary relationship with clients, uh, understanding um, complete transparency on how, how, uh, how financial advisors get compensated. And then, you know, having the advisor role be more of one that, that helps clients with, helping them with particular life events, problems right. that come up, whether it be, 
you know, retirement income planning, going through a divorce, college, um, transitioning. A lot of the things we're seeing recently is helping um, either our clients or parents of our clients, helping them transition to the next stage in life, whether right. it be continuous care retirement communities or helping them outfit their, their houses for aging in place and, and talking through the different financial and, and uh, financial choices and risks associated with, with that. Right. So um, I think the, uh, just in short, that the whole financial service industry is going to go more toward that thinking partner type of a model or coaching model as opposed to a person that just all they're, retur all they're concerned about is the return of the portfolio. Right. I mean, returns, I think, are going to be less... Um, less focused on as opposed to, you know, what's the what's the goal for the money? You right. Know? Um, you know, like, you know, with, in retirement income planning, do you need to have a 7% return if your standard of living only, you know, you're, you're spending a lot less? Maybe you need, you know, right. your portfolio is, you only need to have a 3% return. Right. Then, you know, why? Why take the extra risk? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in those things, I don't think a, a robo solution can really adequately evaluate all the different variables exactly. uh, that might come yeah. along, yeah. Uh, especially f as people <coughs> accumulate more assets and they're in different places um, and they have more decisions to mm -hmm. make. You know, when do they take their pension? How do they take it if they right. take a, an annuity payout? Uh, what about Social Security? How do they take that? Do they delay? Do they take it right. early? Do they take it at their full retirement age? Um, and as you said, what is their sort of family index number mm -hmm. that they have to benchmark exactly. to based on what the money needs to do for them as opposed to some arbitrary index out there that, well, the market was up yeah. 10, so I need to make 10. Yeah. And yeah. you really can't do that without taking a lot of risk. Uh, that's great. Well, we're coming down to about the end of the show. So great. we could talk all, all, uh, all day about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, that's great. Um, well, quickly, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, so they can find me at uh, www.trinity-wealth.com is our website. That All sounds great. Contact information is Excellent. there. Excellent. Well, great. Well, um, let me uh, announce who's going to be up for, for our next show. Our next show, uh, the guest will be Mark Blair of Blair Wealth Management. And it'll be, um, he'll have a lot of interesting things to say. And looking forward to seeing you. And remember, uh, thank you for watching tonight. And remember, your money matters.